It is time to bring in Arthur Schwartz, the food maven. Uh, and Arthur joins us on a Monday morning. Good morning, Arthur. Good morning. Now, for a change, it is a good morning. Before we go any, <laughs> before we go any further, once again, this always happens. When Arthur takes a day off. I had off, a cold. I, when Arthur takes a day off, I literally, and this is, I've never had this happen in my life with an individual show. I literally get emails and text messages. Oh, yeah. Is Arthur all right? And so finally this week, I just, I, I put it down to three words. He four words. He took a vacation day. <laughs> no, I took a. I know. I can't talk because I'm so congested. Day. Yeah. Well, anyways, did they love him? <clears throat> they I'm love still, con- I'm always congested <laughs> in the morning, but I did have a cold, and I it, uh, I did not have any COVID symptoms. But I gave myself a test, and I was negative. Bob was negative. He had the same cold. Every, by the way, everybody we know had the same cold. They just no. love you, though. They just love you, and uh, we don't know that many people. <laughs> <laughs> but they, I'm telling you, but those we do know also had the cold. Yeah. But they, 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 you, when you're not there, it's an it's an important part of their day that's missing, and they must find out why. <laughs> well, let me just say, I you know I missed it too. Yeah. I do, I do miss it. Gives me uh, 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 at the very least. Uh, I mean, I like doing this for many reasons, but at the very least, it gives me an opportunity to vent <laughs> right. uh, publicly. You know, I can complain about airlines, about whatever, uh, but I have to complain mainly today about, and I realized this as I was looking at my little list of pet peeves, that they all happen on food TV. They all happen <laughs> be- somewhere between, I don't know what the numbers are you by you, but there are two, there are two food channels here. And they've, they've melded into the same thing. There are a couple of programs where there are people who actually cook, but what they're cooking, mm, you know, will I ever make it? Probably not. So one of the pet peeves is that America has become the land of garlic powder, salt, onion powder, and salt. These are products that I actually, because I knew that this was happening a couple of years ago, I went out and actually bought some garlic powder and, and garlic and, and whatever they call it, onion powder. And, and, and I used them up. Eventually. Well, the garlic I didn't use up. I threw it away uh, after I used it once or twice. The, the other one I, I kept around until I used it up. Uh, the other product that I see on TV a lot is various kinds of commercial seasoning salt. Well, on the barbecue shows, all these guys make up their own uh, uh, rub. And, and, and barbecue sauces and spice mixtures, and they all include garlic powder, the same ingredients. Paprika, sometimes smoked paprika, garlic powder, onion powder. What else do they throw? Sometimes they put in, depending on the product, they don't put turmeric if it's a brisket, but if it's chicken, they might. Anyway, it really gets on my nerves. And as, not on my nerves, my stomach turns is really what it is. Although, I like to say, because it's cute, um, that the most disheartening thing in my life is watching people enjoy bad food. And there's a lot of that going, much more going around than there used to be, I think. And I think part of the problem is the, the, the taste that people have been weaned on. Now, I was weaned on, my mother was not a cook. I mean, she cooked, and she cooked well enough. And she knew all, as she would tell you, she knew all the holiday recipes. But during normal times, we ate very simply and healthfully. Uh, the only, uh, we were talking about this the other day among some friends. The only uh, um, uh, canned vegetable that we ate in those days was lacer peas. And uh, we didn't even eat frozen vegetables that I can recall. We always had, my mother was weird. She had salad. She made salad. This is in the 50s. Anyway, these days, kids are uh, uh, weaned, so to speak, on products containing way too much sugar, way too much salt, and way too much, I think, of these spices and, and powders. And, and one of the things I hear on food TV, which does annoy me, is, oh, I want this to explode in my mouth. 
I'm sorry, I don't want any explosions in my mouth. Um, and I know how to get them when I want them. Uh, in fact, just last night, I made, a, I made a big pot of chili. That's another thing. This is really good cooking weather, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I made a big pot of chili because I like to keep some in the freezer. It's, that, that, that's one thing that really reheats very well. In fact, a lot of things I make taste better the second day. And uh, uh, it's really good chili. And why was I even mentioning the big pot of chili I made? Who remembers? Oh, well, I don't, I don't, I use real garlic. Uh, no garlic powder. Uh, I don't use commercial chili powder. I use my own homemade chili powder, which my friends seem to think is very special. I have fed it to many people. Um, and I, th- I think it's very special because beyond the heat of the various chilies that I use in grinding up this powder, I have a little spice milk to grind it all up in. Um, uh, 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 I, you can add your own cumin, which I do, and you can add your own oregano, which I do. Uh, but if you buy chili, mostly, if you buy chili powder in the store or in, from a mail order company, it's already mixed, meaning you're getting chili, you know, ground chilies, plus the cumin and oregano that usually comes in, in chili powder in the supermarket. Um, I do it myself, and I think it really makes a big difference. Anyway, I don't know why I was saying I made a big pot of chili, but I did, because it's cooking weather. Anyway, you watch these shows, and it's amazing to me that uh, the explosions are all of the same nature. All this food is tasting alike. The, oh, the other one is macaroni and cheese. I think anybody who is under 40 probably, I don't know, under, yeah, under 40, uh, their first taste of macaroni and cheese was the craft product in the box. And I'm actually tempted, I've been thinking about this lately, I, I, I should buy a box of this stuff. Actually, now you don't even have to buy a box. They have it pre-made in little containers at your microwave. But anyway, I would like to taste that again to see what now is the standard in America for macaroni and cheese. So about half the food on the Food Network or the Cooking Network are hamburgers, and the other half is macaroni and cheese. And even, I must say, the, like a show like uh, The Pioneer Woman, uh, Ree Drummond, who seems to be a very sensible person and a good cook, she tends to, these days, use way more um, of these products, this garlic powder and whatever, uh, than she used to. I made uh, ranch dressing uh, uh, on Saturday, and what did I do? I, I used... Um, I, I, I use real garlic, and I just use the microplane. I think that's the best use of a microplane. Is is to it's to grate garlic. Uh, it sort of it just disappears into your sauce or your whatever your hummus, whatever it is. And I must say, it's a very strong taste. You got to be a little careful. So there I, I those are my pet peeves: garlic powder, which has been for many many years. Now onion powder. And by the way, I know some some younger than I am, not so young anymore, maybe uh, food writers uh, who have taken to this. And actually, there's one, who, uh, somebody who I respect, who swears by onion powder. I made one of her recipes using the onion powder. And I said, well, if somebody served this to me, I would politely eat it, but that would be it. Um, you know, whatever. Yeah, I don't, so I it don't... is cooking weather. Yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Mark. No, I don't. You know, I, 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 the only thing I use occasionally is garlic salt, but onion powder, garlic powder, no, I just don't. I don't. I'm amazed that all this food doesn't taste exactly the same, huh. especially from the barbecue shows where they're all, and and I laugh because they they'll tell you it's a secret blend. <laughs> of a secret blend of paprika, smoked paprika, <laughs> cumin. Or, uh, you know, I like cumin, by the way, but some people are averse to cumin, so you've got to be careful with cumin. But anyway, you know, uh, it seems to me it's all exploding in your mouth with the same detonator. Uh, anyway, I've been cooking, and I'm not a cook who puts a lot of stuff in there. Uh, one of the things that I've been craving, I'm back, by the way, on doing very, very, very low carb. But before I, I decided I'd better do that again, 
for a little while anyway. I was eating my favorite carbs, which includes rice and lentils and chickpeas and black beans. And mainly, you know, I have to say, and I was eating pasta, a moderate amount of pasta, not so much bread, but I did have to make mujadara. Did I talk about this already? No, I don't, so. I don't think so. Well, maybe I did, but I'm going to compliment myself here. I think I have, I'm like an idiot savant when it comes to recipes. I wanted to make this, and I could not remember how much water to put in for one cup of lentils and one cup of rice, how much water. And I'm thinking, eh, about three cups. But to make sure, let me find the recipe. Well, I look in my files, computer files, I do a computer search, and I find that I've never published a recipe for, uh, this is lentils and rice, Middle Eastern style, made in a lot of countries. I'm, I call it mujadara, but I think there's other pronunciations for this. Um, and uh, I find that when I finally find the recipe, in my files never published, but in my files, I find that my memory going, this is, uh, this is 20 years ago, this re- I wrote up this recipe. I knew, I, except I was a half a cup off on the, on the water. And I, I made it exactly as the recipe called for, because that's exactly what was in my head. So it was uh, one cup of lentils. Oh, by the way, this is the pottage, to use a biblical word, uh, that Esau um, sold his birthright for. He had to be very hungry. Um, but it is a comfort food to most Middle Easterners, and to Schwartz here, too. So I boil a cup of lentils in three and a half cups of water, covered. And the reason I say covered is because you do not want the water to evaporate before it's time with the rice. Uh, I figured this out the last time I made it. I mean, this is only last week. And... uh, I ended up having to add a tiny bit of water, but not because. So I'm making three and a half cups of water, one cup of lentils, covered. Simmer the lentils until they're not quite done, not altogether tender, but tender enough. Now this totally depends on what lentils you're using. I use lentils that take a good 25 minutes to get tender. If you're using uh, the the larger brown lentils that sell in the supermarket from Michigan, just called lentils, <laughs> on the bag or the box, uh, then they may take a little less time. You'll have to taste it. At this point, once they're semi-tender, you add your seasonings, a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of cumin, a quarter teaspoon of allspice, and you will have separately, before you even start this, fried four cups of sliced onions until they're very well browned uh, in olive oil. I do olive oil. You can do plain oil, but I like the flavor of the olive oil here. So uh, about three tablespoons of olive oil, four cups of onions, um, salt them as they're cooking, uh, cook them down until some of them really get very dark. Anyway, so now you have your, your adding, after the lentils are cooked, almost, you add one cup of, uh, you add your seasonings and half of the, um, the fried onions, just half, and one cup of rice and stir it and simmer it very slowly, you know, low heat, covered, you're cooking rice, um, for about 18 minutes. I find that mm, could even be 20 minutes. That also depends on your rice. Now, at that point, uh, let it stay on the uh, covered uh, and let it sit for a bit. If you're not going to eat it right away, and you don't have to, this reheats extremely well. If you, uh, I take the rest of the onions and put them on the top of the uh, rice and lentils together, scrape it nice and get all that oil into the pot, you know, let it drip in, and cover the pot and let it sit. That's it. Then you toss it at the last minute. Now, if you're going to eat it right away, then you can turn out the lentils and rice onto a platter and top it with the fried onions. Now, I eat this with chopped salad, meaning tomato, cucumber, and and if I have them, scallions. Um, 
Uh, I also eat it just with, you know, um, with some yogurt. Uh, if you use, if you have Greek yogurt in the house, thin it out with a little water because uh, you want the yogurt to be, you know, liquidy, not, 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 not a big dollop of yogurt. Uh, you can have t- uh, just chopped tomato on top, um, and or you can eat it as a side dish. And it, by the way, reheats in the microwave extremely well. So I don't mind making too much of it, so to speak. Um, that's a loss. I mean, for us, we're a household of two. That's at least enough for uh, four, maybe even six. Depends. Um, very good uh, vegetarian dish, by the way. May I say that? And uh, gluten-free. I have, I have a neighbor who, she's been gluten-free for 25 years. I, I trust that she's medically it's necessary for her and still she calls me about like what can I make that's gluten free blah blah and I keep telling her rice is gluten free and is, you know if you're if you're craving I have to say if you, any pasta sauce you could also put on rice the other thing that I cooked this past week given the weather is my grandmother's sweet and sour cabbage soup. I say my grandmother's because I was weaned on this. This is one of the flavors of my youth, one of my favorite flavors. Um, It's sweet and sour from tomatoes, yes, sugar, and in my grandmother's case and my case, uh, sour salt, which is actually citric acid crystals, which is the souring agent. If you don't have or don't want to buy any, you can use lemon juice or, I guess, even vinegar. I've never done the vinegar, but there's no reason you can't. But uh, I have to say, this recipe is in my best-selling cookbook, Soup Suppers. Uh, but I wouldn't make it that way again. I don't know what I was thinking. You know, this is the season where cabbage and tomatoes intersect. But I am not going to make my cabbage soup again <laughs> with fresh tomatoes. Um, even though I can buy really nice uh, Roma, you know, plum tomatoes right now for practically nothing, because the farmers all think, well, this is the last day I'm going to be able to harvest these. Anyway, I, I years ago was eating sweet and sour cabbage soup with meat. By the way, this is a meat dish, um, and the, and what inspired me besides the season of the intersection of cabbage and tomatoes is that I scored some really good-looking flanken, which is short ribs cut uh, across the bones um, instead of in the same direction as the bones. And I, I, the market I shop in had really meaty, not all that fatty, although it's always fatty flanken. And, and uh, we love flanken. And we love it because it's very, very melt-in-your-mouth if cooked long and slow. So anyway, I, don't, I use flanken. And I used uh, a cabbage. Of course, it's cabbage soup. Um, but I, I, what I did was what my grandmother would do, which was put the, 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 the flanken in, in water and simmer it for, I don't know, a good hour, slow, uh, salted water. If when you first put it in, you get some ugly foam coming to the top, uh, skim that off. And then once it's uh, you sort of flavored the water, so to speak, but it's hardly tender, um, add a, a small head of cabbage. I used, I think it was about two and a half pounds I weighed it for two nice slices. It was a little over a pound of flanken. Um, I had uh, two and a half pounds of cabbage. And then I started to say years ago I ate cabbage, was eating cabbage soup in this kosher restaurant here in Brooklyn, and it tasted just like my grandmother's. And I, said, I, I, I asked the chef, a Polish woman, um, what uh, what she did, and it ended up she used ketchup as her tomato product. Now, ketchup, Heinz ketchup, was one of the first, what wasn't one of, it was the first commercial, let's call it American food product, grocery item, that carried the OU, the, the symbol of the kosher authorizing agency called the Orthodox Union, and the, the Heinz in Pittsburgh 
uh, appeal to the Orthodox Union to come up with a symbol that they could put on their products to indicate to the Jewish uh, kosher uh, uh, market that they were kosher and they were willing to have inspection, blah, blah, and pay, pay for uh, an inspector, a kosher inspector. So that was not a problem. Um, and they came up with the, the U in a circle, O-U. Um, and this way, the kosher market would know it was kosher, but it wouldn't offend <laughs> those other people who were bigots, basically. Um, so that that was 1926. It was the first um, kosher product. And, of course, uh, Jews loved that flavor profile. Uh, it's an Eastern European sweet, sour, tomato flavor profile. And Heinz ketchup, there's nothing non-kosher about Heinz ketchup. So the recipe that appears in Jewish home cooking, my eventual Jewish cookbook, is very different than the one that's in Soup Suppers, which was written at least 10 years before. And it includes ketchup. So I didn't want to leave the house the day I, was, I had my cold. And I was looking for a soup. That's why I ended up with the cabbage soup. And I had scored this great flunkin. So I thought, ah, there it is. So I I I, um, I used some cat. I remembered my late and unlamented former mother-in-law, who did make great cabbage soup and stuffed cabbage, by the way, too. The same flavor profile. She put in every known tomato product in her cabbage soup, meaning <laughs> tomato puree, chopped tomatoes. Tomato paste. I don't know. Did maybe she put ketchup in there too? I don't know. She was a good cook, and uh, a lot of good cooks. Uh, old-time Jewish recipes call for ketchup. Uh, in fact, you know, I grew up with kids who only knew about spaghetti with ketchup. They never ate Italian uh, tomato sauce or meat sauce, which I grew up eating because we always had Sicilian or Neapolitan neighbors. Anyway. Um, I was. I always say I was weaned on ziti with ragu, so that's it. Um, the cabbage soup mm, simmers. So you put in all these tomatoes. Now, if you just use a bottle of ketchup, for instance, you may not have to add any souring agent. I did have to add um, mm, probably as much as a quarter of a cup of sugar and uh, some sour salt, and I doctored it until what my grandmother would say. It tastes whiny, you know, like wine, meaning I don't know what she was thinking. She was thinking Manischewitz, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> this, it had, hers was, was it's, it usually is a, uh, more on the sweet side probably than the sour side, but you do it to taste. That's what I did. And salt, you've got to put salt. By the way, here's a hint. Whenever you're making anything with a sour taste or, for that matter, um, um, well, mainly for, with a sour taste. Um, you, you, you. Uh, I lost my thread. I lost my thread. Are you there, Marshall? I'm here. I don't know what I'm saying this morning. That's all right. Yeah, you know, uh, 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 even with a cold, you get foggy. <laughs> <laughs> my my middle name is Foggy. <laughs> sorry. My middle name is Foggy. Well, here I am. <clears throat> And it is foggy here. I don't know what's doing up there, but here, I don't know, I didn't even look. Is it going to rain today? I think it could. Yeah, we're going to have showers, yeah. We're going to have showers. Uh, yeah, today. I think so. Well, it, it's it's now only cloudy, and that's the way it's going to stay. So it's a good cooking day today, too, got to say. Um, and But I'm well stocked. Over the weekend, I was able to make a big pot of chili. Uh, a good portion of that is in the freezer. Uh, the cabbage soup turned out so delicious. I gotta say <laughs> that we finished that in two meals. Uh, but this is when you cook only for two. You know, then I can say we, it's good for two meals. The mujadara we ate for a couple days. Um, eventually, I think we just uh, we just had it as a side dish to the to some grilled chicken, which was good. We're into grilled chicken. I don't know. I don't know. I, I like. I I. I, I 
I like grilled chicken, but not as much as I like uh, roasted chicken and uh, you know rotisserie chicken and stuff. Like well, that. I don't mean when I said grilled chicken, I mean I do it in the oven. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't. Right, I don't have a grill. Right. <laughs> I do. I do grill vegetables because they don't create too much. They don't create any smoke. <laughs> but I have a, a lot of trouble, you know, with ventilation here. So I, 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 I don't dare have an open flame. That's for sure. So you know, I, 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 I rotisserie a chicken, a small chicken yesterday, and I put the. Then I chopped up some mushrooms, uh, some uh, green uh, green peas, corn, carrots, uh, and uh, I. Cook the mushrooms by themselves and mix them in with the other. Then I put. Uh, I made a little. And you bashmil. don't invite me more. So. I made a bash meal and then I made, I made homemade, chicken pot pie. Oh my! One of my favorite things. What'd you do for pastry? I, my kitchen was a mess, but I made it because I've been practicing, oh and uh, I still have a ways to go. It's still a little. I don't know. It's still a little. It's, it's just off a little bit, but. Uh, what a little bit? It's off a little bit, you know. Like this is, you know, if you go to a real nice pastry store, there's, it's, it's, it's just got a certain feel to it where mine doesn't have it yet. Well, I, I must say, I am not against buying frozen pastry. I think most of these companies make it better than I do. Well, that's um, obvious in my case. <laughs> but, and 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 there's, oh, my big news is. <laughs> You know, I'm always talking about the snob supermarkets around here. Well, a normal supermarket is about to open, according to the manager, on Wednesday. And I believe him because as we walked by the other day, on Saturday, when there were five big sign outside, uh, we, we talked to a young man who seems to be supervising everything, and he was indeed the manager. We peeked inside, and I said, well, you must be opening soon because you have milk in the dairy case. <laughs> How long is that going to last? He said, Wednesday. We're, we're, we're aiming for Wednesday. And they've been working very fast. It's interesting. As, as my friend said last night, the neighbor, um, they must have gotten a really good lease. They're spending a lot of money on refurbishing this location. So we're excited the neighborhood thing. I'm not. I, I'm sure it's not worth traveling to. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you'll have a better, a de- more options. Well, I mean, we'll ha- no. We have, we only have these snob, overpriced places that I, I mean, I can get in the car and go elsewhere. But within walking distance, uh, the, there is a, a, a. Oh, this is interesting. I think this young man was Palestinian. And I said, I don't know how that came. Oh, I, we asked him. I said, we said, are you Middle Eastern? Because it ends up, and I have to do a little research on this, the Palestinians and other Middle Easterners um, own the supermarkets in Brooklyn. They seem to be all owned by uh, Middle Eastern people. Uh, in our neighborhood, they're either Palestinian-owned or Yemeni-owned. And in fact, the the Yemeni are uh, are so observant; uh, they do not sell pork products, not even hot dogs made with pork, and they don't sell beef. I mean, I learned only this because I went in one day to one of their two supermarkets to buy beer and found out they don't sell beer. Right. In Brooklyn, supermarkets sell beer. In fact, I think it's a major profit center. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, anyway, so I'll, I, I, next week I can tell you the exciting news. I can buy Hellman's mayonnaise around the corner. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. All right, have a great week, everybody. Cook away. It, it, it's an opportunity this week. It's going, it's going to be chilly out there and cloudy. And, and, you can, and, and if you still have any herbs in the garden, I would suggest bringing them in and, and either leave, uh, wintering them over indoors or just dry them. I dry everything these days. It's be- Even dried parsley is better than any parsley you can buy. And sometimes I have leftover parsley. And what am I going to do with it? I let yeah. it dry. Yeah. All right. Have All a right, week. my friends. Have a good I'm, week. I'm, my cold is better. I'll be back next week. All right. We'll speak to you next week, Arthur. Bye. Arthur Schwartz, the food maven here on The Breakfast Club on Robin Hood Radio. Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, Hillsdale Home Chef. More information. 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com.